so, hi. Uh, my name is Christo Zulas, and I've been with NetBSD forever. And uh, for the past uh, year, I've been trying to get uh, NetBSD to work with reproducible builds. So, my first, this picture is very relevant to me because uh, although this is a very old picture, my first contact with reproducibility is my homework when I was in elementary school. And although they had a much more modern version of this, that's how they gave us our homework. And, uh, you know, it looked almost the same, uh, so we were, it was kind of consistent. Uh, but why do we want to have reproducible builds? So first of all, you know, would you buy a product that's different every time? Like, let's consider you buying a soft drink. Like, would you buy a product that tastes differently every time? Or depending on if it was manufactured in the States or in Paris or, uh, you know, if it was manufactured today or tomorrow and tasted differently? Yes. Or, yes, you would. <laughs> well, I don't think that everybody else would. But anyway, uh, it, or depending on which factory built it, or if it was raining, or if it was uh, hot or cold while it was built. Well, I don't think so. And, uh, you know, in science, uh, reproducibility is one of the uh, major cornerstones. And, you know, very lately we have seen even there, uh, you know, complaints from the scientific community that there is kind of lack of reproducibility. People are coming up with, uh, you know, very wild claims and other laboratories around the world have trouble reproducing them. Uh, and this is because uh, we don't really have a clear process to go from the ingredients or from the basic premise uh, up to the result. And so there is a lot of gaps in the way that we're describing our, our processes and these kind of gaps make reproducibility impossible. Uh, so, you know, in software we're doing well with open source, but then we're also doing poorly because we don't have a real good engineering process when we build things. And yes, you know, we, uh, you know, can sign the, uh, you know, the result of the build, the package, the installed media, and we can sign the source that built the media, that provides, you know, uh, that we trust the person who built it and we trust that nothing has been uh, tampered with it in, in the process, but, you know, can we verify that this person built this source and produced this uh, binary artifact? You know, and today, for most things, it's impossible because, you know, even if we take the source and build it ourselves, it won't match. So, reproducibility is all about the ability to make sure that the path from, you know, the source tree or the repository down to the distribution media, the CD-ROM, let's say, is producing exactly the same results. There are people who are saying this is a waste of time and, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. We have better things to do, you know, instead of spending time twiddling bits and time stamps, we should really fix, be fixing bugs. Uh, you know, all of this 100% reproducibility is kind of useless. You know, we should make sure that at least uh, we have certain things that are reproducible. For example, the results of the compiler. You know, if you build a particular binary, a particular compiler flags, it's the same all the time. But not go all the way from source to binary to, to see the wrong. And that makes life really complicated for everybody because uh, you know, you end up with a CD-ROM that looks like an onion, you know, you have to keep, uh, you know, picking up and picking up and picking up and taking things apart until you find out what, why, you know, the, <coughs> the checksum of that CD-ROM doesn't match to the one you actually uh, just built right now. And, you know, yeah, the implanted backdoor is, is real, but, you know, it's getting uh, less important if you sign things. And bitwise reproducibility is attainable. Lots of uh, uh, you know, open source product, if you look at reproducibilebuilds.org, uh, you know, have achieved that. So, I was very lucky to start with NetBSD actually, uh, because uh, it made my life very, very simple. Uh, people have done, have done most of the work already. Uh, you know, NetBSD has a single source code repository, I don't have to go around the internet and fetch tarballs to build a distribution. Uh, there's an integrated tool chain that means that already because people have been thinking about this, everything that is supposed to be building uh, binary artifacts that are participating in the end product has been toolified 
So that means that there's no external dependencies to the operating system uh, to use the operating system tools to build things that I need to be reproducible. And there's cross build enable. So basically, what it means is I can build on a different operating system, and that's what Debian, the Debian folks do when with reproducibleBuilds.org. They just download our source, they run build.sh, and that's all they have to do uh, to get the full NetBSD build. And we can build on different CPU architectures trivially on uh, cross builds. Because these days, you know, nobody wants to build on the slower CPU they have, they build on the fastest. So that means that for most architectures, this is you know a different architecture than the target architecture. So if you look, go to this website, you see basically what is you see exactly this. The red stuff is mine. So they build things twice. They they add a few variations, which I'll get later. They are comparing them with a tool called Diffoscope, which is basically diff on steroids. So it, it's responsible. This tool is a great tool. It's responsible for actually peeling the onion, you give it a CD-ROM and it goes down and takes it apart, apart, apart until it finds a source of difference and then it, it runs the appropriate tool. For example, if that's an ELF file, it runs, you know, for example, read ELF and compares the sections and then uh, brings the hex differences. So, uh, and all of that is on the website. So it's very nice because, you know, you, every week you, I went there and I was disappointed by seeing my bills were still different. But on the other hand, I, they would just pinpoint all of the parts of the bills that were different. And that runs all automatically. And right now, since I think uh, the beginning of the year, like in February, March, uh, we are fully reproducible on both architectures, on Spark 64 and x86-64 that gets built uh, weekly on uh, Debian. So Debian varies a couple of few things. Uh, you know, as you can see, some of the things are not being varied. So it varies path, language, environment, time zone, Etc. And it also varies the U mask. Uh, you know, it doesn't vary the CPU. It, you know, doesn't vary the file system. But these are the things that people are considering. Uh, you know, as the sources of differences that prevent us from uh, doing the reproducible builds. Well, if you distill them down, there are really ten categories here. So there are timestamps, uh, as you know, dates and times embedded in the source code. There, we build things depending on time zone and we you know, uh, embed timestamps that are time zone dependent. Uh, parallelism is another uh, issue on source order. Uh, if we try to build things with random data inside them, uh, a really nasty one is paths, you know, normalization. Uh, the tools that I mentioned, build parameters, environment virus, and you know, finally, uh, it would be nice to be able to build as anybody and be able to build a CD-ROM that is exactly the same. So, what timestamps do you use? So, we have been decided that the best time to, time to use is the latest timestamp or the latest commit, and you know, we call that MK Retro timestamp for historical reasons. We might change that so it's exactly the same as Linux, uh, and. Uh, all the file system objects get this timestamp. So to find it, when we start the build, you know, we have to, uh, you know, get the timestamp of the latest commit. That's very easy with Git and Mercurial. Unfortunately, CVS, uh, we use CVS, it's not. So, you know, I, I don't want to get too much of that slide, but let's put it this way, that uh, CVS takes a view of, uh, uh, you know, the, the repository is a directory by directory and file by file. There is no kind of global view. So uh, there is also an issue with updates versus checkouts, where because updates uh, make the files have a current timestamp. And that's because it makes sense. Let's say that you're in a directory that you're building a program, uh, let's call it foo.sa, the .c, and you just build it. Now you see the S update, and there is a newer version of foo.c. You want the, the, the new foot.c you just downloaded to have the latest timestamp, so it's newer than what it was just built because it was just updated, and so that it gets rebuilt next time you run make. On the other hand, this is not the right timestamp, so we, I just added a flag called minus t to check out consistent timestamp. So when you update your tree to make reproducible builds, you can do that. And finally, I wrote a tool called CVS Latest that scans the CVS repository, all the metadata files uh, in the CVS entries, and finds the latest timestamp, and that is becoming your timestamp. 
Then you have to add timestamp support to everything that embeds timestamp in its output form. And the first three are obvious, Pakistan and NativeFest. The second one, less so, but it is because it uses dynamic UUID generation based on timestamps. So this has to be deterministic too. Uh, R in BDU builds already has minus D for deterministic builds. And that basically makes all the timestamps zero and the UID and GID it embeds in the archive zero, which is very nice. Uh, and because it's not very useful, uh, people don't use R as you know, a file transfer uh, you know, to preserve timestamp format anymore, so the timestamps in there are less than useful. And finally, all of the documents that use the macro to print the date that the document was formatted need to be changed. And for that, you know, expedient says just take it away, so I just disable it for you know, conditionally the make file if it was doing reproducible builds. So for embedded thing, dates and times, you have to remove these three macros from the sources, and that's what I did. Uh, you know, eventually you can put them back and have CPP obey, obey the environment variable to build, to put the, these variable, to set those variables based on the correct timestamp. And again, there are, there are file system formats that want to obey local time, like ISO images. And for those, again, you have to make it consistent. So you just choose GMT in this case. So going to the next step, you know, we have directory and sort order. So things that scan sets of files and from directories and to build artifacts, they need to order those. And then, which was easy to do, you just sort them. But the most problematic one was basically install info. So when you do a parallel build and you use install info, uh, every program that you build, a bank puts uh, its information inside the global uh, the info file. And that means that this ends up being out of order. Since uh, you know, it's complicated to fix every version of, of uh, the tools out there, I just decided to just write a simple text for processing tool to sort them after the build was done, each build was done. By far the most complicated and painful one was uh, is GCC. And GCC has many, many different nuanced issues here. The first one is basically uh, the expansion of underscore underscore file. And for that, you can use minus i remap, which is an FBSD extension. By the way, there are patches for these uh, in uh, the NetBSD <coughs> bug, uh, website, but there is, there is a controversy of like how many or which one of these and how to do them exactly. So the first one is easy, you just, you know, it just remaps the path. The second one is a little bit more complicated. So there is a minus F debug prefix map inside GCC right now. The problem is that you can't really put the source path in there, and that's why this thing is quoted around. It's because if you put the source path, what happens is that the expanded source path ends up in the DWAT producer and DWAT comp DIR uh, path. So, uh, here, oops, sorry. There. There. So, uh, you see, basically, if I was putting the full source path there, I wouldn't get this symbolic path, I would get the expanded path. So, that would be different in every build depending on where I build. So the, ext the extension here to GCC was basically to go and uh, expand the environment variable in the source if it finds a dollar, instead of uh, you know, having to put the expanded path there. And finally, the more complicated stuff was after this is applied, so basically now your tree is already normalized to user source, depending if you're building on NetBSD with object directories or not, uh, you know, your, your uh, build paths become different. So uh, I added another option called debug regex map. I mean, I, I guess that if GC, GCC has people have trouble taking this one, uh, they will never take that one. So I don't know what to do about that. But nevertheless, what that does is it uses kind of a uh, regex capture syntax, like I said, to map things around so that things are being consistent if you're using object directories or not. The same think trivially is added for lint, again, for uh, lint libraries. And that does it with paths from GCC. 
Now, unfortunately, we have to deal with symbolic links. And, you know, it's fine to, uh, to limit your, your build saying, okay, it has to be rooted at a particular directory and that has to be user source. I mean, that's a limitation. But we don't want that. We want people to build without root and to build with whatever directories they want to build. And those directories can contain symlinks anywhere. So the problem is that programs, when they start up, they can either believe what PWD is, verify it, or use getCWD to get the current working directory. So typically, what we want them to do is we want them to be consistent. In make, if you type cd other dir and make, depending on what shell you use, this can actually uh, you know, take the logical path and convert it to physical before it runs make. And that kind of screws up things for us. So the solution there is to basically make make, obey uh, the working directory, and then instead of using the shell to change directory and then invoke the mail, make to basically uh, use make directly to tell it to change to the path. That feature already existed, so you know you can do that. And we did that because make is already a tool, but the, the shell is not. So basically, we're using the operating system shell, so we can't depend on it. But we build our own make, so you know we can depend on it to do the right thing. So, what is a tool now? So this is a list of all of uh, you know machine-independent tools that participate in the build. So these are all the programs that produce some kind of output that needs to be consistent and needs to be guaranteed to be there. Some of them, uh, you know, they don't exist uh, in certain tool chains. For example, if you build on Sigwin, you might not find some of them might not be installed and you don't want the build to break, or some of those might have particular NetBSDs, that's a Jenison. Uh, so, some of them are used for Kerberos, like Compile T. There's a lot of them out there, but this is the total set of machine-independent tools. Machine-independent means that no matter what the architecture is, I need those tools and they have to produce cross-architecture independent builds. Then we have the tools that are machine-dependent, which is basically your standard tool chain, assemblers, linkers, etc. You will notice that Make is both machine independent and machine dependent. That's because Make knows about your current architecture. And this Make is the shell script wrapper that is architecture specific, where the other one is the architecture uh, neutral. So the other thing that's very complicated, as you well know, is that every package has different build options. You can build with different backend libraries, with different defines, different features, this and that. And the NetBSD process avoids all of this by providing build default. So everything that every program that is packaged on NetBSD has its own default. Uh, unfortunately, we don't yet provide full isolation. So uh, if you have an mk.conf that has different values and you don't uh, specify that it shouldn't be used, that will override some of the parameters and may produce introduce, uh, inter, uh, producing uh, incompatible builds, but it's simple enough to fix, we just haven't done it yet. So this is a set of parameters, for example, that have va values, not just, uh, you know, booleans. And these are the tunables that we have uh, in NetBSD. So you see, uh, there are just too many of them. You, if, you, if you wanted to build uh, you know, a build for every single combination of them, you would have, I don't know, uh, what is it, like 12 times 7, uh, 2 to the 12 times 7 kind of combination of builds, and that is unwieldy. I mean, some of them we should just get rid of. So as far as the last part, which is like the isolation of uh, the build environment uh, to provide a useful build, uh, you know, you, you can go for the extreme case where you control, you totally control the environment, which means that I'm going to only be able to build reproducibly if I have a VM. So I construct a VM, I know the exact VM parameters, uh, and then I can only build in the VM, and this is the only way I can make reproducible builds. Well, that's the easy part, but it's also the least satisfactory one. Uh, but you have to go both ways. You have to like both fix the source and fix the things that are easy to fix, and then the things that have value as opposed to depend on your environment to give you reproducible builds. So, for example, all of the things that we did to sanitize the source and sanitize the build system are great, 
but if you wanted to build as non-root user, it's harder. But fortunately, NetBSD has already done that. And uh, so you can just pa pass it flat to the build uh, to basically uh, build and privilege. And the way you do this is basically uh, we teach all of the programs again that produce artifacts that contain user information, like packs, make effects, and install, to uh, be able to take a specification and produce them. Uh, and that specification is uh, with a program called Entry, which is very common, all the BSDs have it, and actually we recently synchronized it between FreeBSD and NetBSD, so it's almost identical. And make sure that the only thing that actually installs binary artifacts, those be directories or files, is installed. And then when you do that, you can only use install to install those files. And by specifying this flag, uh, the install program, instead of setting the permissions on the destination files, it just appends them to the meta log. So when you actually build tar files or you make a file system, you can tell it to consult the permissions for those paths from the metalog and put them inside the binary artifacts using the correct user. So you can actually build without being root and end up with the same results. So to build NetBSD current and NetBSD 8, they're all already built with reproducible flags. You know, you just need to say build with say minus capital P, which means that if you go to the release engineering website, and download uh, you know, the, the binary artifacts of a particular build at the source state for a particular architecture, you should be able to run the same build, you build the same, that source you just downloaded, and if your binaries that you build should be identical to the ones that you downloaded from the build server. So uh, the reproducibility is not checked though, which means that we yet are not doing two different two different builds with variations like Debian does to make sure that we haven't violated the reproducibility in our builds. Uh, we should upstream the GCC patches and then, as I mentioned, uh, we got it a lot of uh, time date reporting on boot logs, for example, it's VP micros on NROF to, for expediency to uh, basically have reproducible builds. We could put those back to just be consistent. So you can see, as you can see here, this is uh, from one of my machines called Broadway, and uh, you can see that you know the shell has the right timestamp. You know when you list it. Uh, if you start PS again, it has 12:31:32, and if you run uname, you can see that again that was the timestamp that uh, the kernel was built. It's pretty neat to see the whole file system have one timestamp. There were. There are other bugs, and you know, we need to add more sources for randomness during the build. Uh, you know, one of the very important ones is that uh, uh, you know, we have sometimes uninitialized memory, uh, and uh, setting it to different values between builds can actually reveal more sources and more bugs that we have to fix. Uh, ASLR is again a big help. Uh, you know, basically, what that means is that if you're storing pointers uh, that you are, have mileage in the build, this change uh, and instead of being always the same, so you, when you compare them, you can see that they're actually storing build pointers that would make no sense as opposed to zeros in your data structures. In particular, this one was storing stuff inside the super block of FFS and MakeFS. And then, you know, there's other randomness that uh, is in tools that we haven't fixed. I mean, basically, uh, there is a bug in GCC on some of the risk machines that when you build with profile, uh, it uses the function ID number to build labels, and that function ID number changes depending on uh, the order of optimization of some function. So you have to turn the optimizer off uh, to produce consistent results. Apparently, there is some randomness in uh, sorting the functions uh, or processing the function, the processing order function. And finally, I would like to thank to uh, you know the NetBSD Foundation for having all of this stuff almost ready to go, and uh, the Debian people uh, for giving us both the infrastructure and being you know a very strong force for everyone to 
uh, work towards getting most open source to be reproducible build and supporting great tools such as Diffoscope and the individuals who actually worked on reproducible builds like York and Thomas and uh, the people who worked on Luke and Todd who worked on Build of the Sage. So thank you very much. Toolchain bugs actually, uh, you know, they're hard to fix. I mean, there are different ways of fixing them, but. Yeah, yeah, and I also notice the same thing with Clang that depending on whether it uses with SD, C, C, or the C, it uses a different hash map implementation internally, which causes, in the end, that certain instructions in the assembly are placed in different order. Yeah. So, yeah, this is this, this is uh, this is the, the whole frustrating process of you know getting to the last mile and saying you know that I I finally produce two identical results. Some of them you know are really nasty to fix and they yeah. don't depend on you and you have to have a lot of buy-in from upstream to tell them, look guys, you know we want a reproducible build, so make it reproducible. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Yes, as a direct reply to that, uh, the, there are some efforts in the uh, land of finding bugs uh, related to uh, iteration or of data structures. So they're, they're currently uh, adding uh, new options to, for example, force people's iteration of certain data structures or having uh, explicit different iteration orders for the data structures uh, and, and that flag and uh, to flush all these kinds of parts. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one uh, uh, about the constant folding, um, that they just don't do that. Don't depend on constant folding or the constant dimensional function. It, it's supposed to be fine for all the functions where the standard actually says uh, the result must be precise. Uh, <coughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. What's your question? It's a comment, not a question, but uh, over from the uh, Debian Reproducible Builds uh, project. Uh, says hi, and uh, would like you to come to the Reproducible Builds Summit uh, coming up in Berlin. Okay, thank you very much. Good. 